Hello and welcome to our viewers here in Nigeria and all around the world. The father of a 15-year-old Michigan school gunman who killed four students in November 2021 has been convicted of manslaughter. The trial heard that 47-year-old James Crumbly Hart ignored his son Ethan's uh, mental health needs, buying him a, a handgun he used in the attack. He and his wife, convicted on the same charges, both face a maximum of 15 years in prison. The case is thought to mark the first time the parents of a mass shooter have been held criminally liable. The couple are, however, scheduled to be sentenced on April 9th. In Europe, hundreds of farmers are staging protests in Spain. Demonstrators gathered in front of the government's subdelegation in Malaga to protest the ongoing crisis in Spanish agriculture. Farmers can be seen spreading lemons on the streets. The protests, organized by agricultural organizations, marked the sixth demonstration by farmers who are demanding urgent action to address the challenges facing the sector. Central to the farmers' demands is the call for higher prices for national agricultural products and the imposition of restrictions on the uncontrolled importation of goods from regions such as Morocco and South America. Concerns were also raised about the lack of health and safety regulations governing imported products. And away from Spain, the security situation in Haiti remains dire. But against all odds, the World Food Program was able to provide some sort of assistance to about 13,000 displaced people. It is now calling for urgent $10 million in aid to be able to provide more support to people in need amid the ongoing gang violence in the country. The World Food Program was able to provide hot meals to about 13,000 displaced people. But the World Food Program tells us that this service in Port-au-Prince might be shut down next week if new funding is not secured. Uh, WFP urgently needs $10 million to be able to sustain this life-saving program. Overall funding this year for the Humanitarian Response Plan is inching up very slowly, but it is inching up. We're now at 3.2% um, funded with about $21.6 million uh, in the bank. Needless to say, much more is needed uh, to meet Haiti's humanitarian needs for this coming year. The Pan American Health Organization, um, UNICEF and the International Organization for Migration through their national partners are providing medical assistance via mobile clinics at several sites for display people as well as other key assistance such as water and psycho uh, psychological assistance as you've heard uh, we are reconfiguring our presence in Haiti while remaining fully committed to delivering life-saving assistance to the people of Haiti the United Nations has authorized a temporary relocation of some internationally recruited personnel from Haiti, while other who are crisis specialists and humanitarian personnel will be coming in uh, to help uh, with the operations on the ground. Well, let's cross over live to Kearns in England, where preventive terrorism consultant and president Africa Security Forum, uh, Temitokwe Olodo, joins us live on the program. Temitokwe, we must thank you most kindly for agreeing to speak with us here on Channels TV. Well, Haiti's capital, Port Prince, has been plagued by an uptick in rampant gang violence since January this year. That has forced a shutdown of the country's main airport and plunging the nation further into a, a chaos. Um, my first question, who are these gangs and uh, what exactly do they want? Thank you so much for having me. I think uh, the gangs are well known. Um, they've been studied internationally by many security analysts. There are two main gangs, really, to talk about. Uh, the one led by a former uh, U.N. police, um, Haiti police officer, who is wanted, of course, uh, called the G9. And then there is the, the other one also. But they all form alliance now since September 2023, and they are now asking for the outing of the, of the president. And this is where it becomes very uh, concerning, because um, like um, many of your viewers we know, 
Um, this is a very poor country. Um, most of the country, most of the resources of the country, they don't really have a resource. After, you know, the earthquake, the devastating earthquake, you know, and the leader coming in after the assassination of the, the president. So what they're asking now for is that the present prime minister should leave, you know, the scene and is agreed to do that and hand over to a nine, you know, council committee. But of course, they don't want that. They don't want um, foreign boot on the ground, which is the Kenya-led group. So we, we have a serious situation here where there are over 200,000 people who are internally displaced. There is literally, you know, the whole system has more or less collapsed. The police cannot handle the situations. These guys are well equipped, you know, unlike, you know, the gangs of the past. And, you know, they, they are more or less threatening us. The report that was is coming to us or released by WhatsApp um, yesterday evening, saying that you know politicians should stay clear. You know anybody that wants to join those council that the U.S. and you know and the United Nations try to broker, you know, will be dealt with. Even if their families will be dealt with. So these gangs are well equipped, and that is where the problem is. And even the Kenya led group that was meant to go in to try and restore law or order or help the police service there are holding you know their deployment because they want to you know understand you no know, at least see what will happen with the council that is being inaugurated i mean just as you've mentioned uh jimmy uh, charizia who has been nicknamed barbecue is one of the main gang leaders. Um, I mean, he had, of course, previously warned of a possible civil war and genocide unless uh, Prime Minister um, Ariel Henry steps down. Well, the Prime Minister had has indeed stepped down, but we, 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 the, the violence uh, has been ongoing for quite some time now. So do these gangs have the backing of the people, those who are resident in Haiti? I think part of the challenge that we are with every other, with any country that is in such chaos is that there is high unemployment, there is hardly any food. The whole world is going through a, a, a living cost crisis. So you could just imagine what is happening in Haiti. And just like you I highlighted earlier, you know, even the thirteen thousand a hot meal that is being provided and the ten million that is being asked for is just a drop in the ocean taking into consideration that 360,000 Haiti families are displaced. So mm -hmm. we have a situation where, you know, the crisis is getting really hard, you know, and the only option that people that are unemployed, youth that are unemployed have is to join this group. So we need to break that cycle of criminality that is going on. But the problem we have now is that these guys are not just interested in their criminal activities alone, but they are also interested in testing a little bit of power. Because these guys were created by political bodies because we know that the two factions that you rightly mentioned, you know, the barbecue guy and his, his, um, his, his opposition, were all uh, affiliated with the opposition party, the other group, which is the um, name escape me now, it, it, it's um, they were afflicted with the opposition party. Why this one, the um, <clears throat> the barbecue guy was uh, afflicted with the ruling party. So what you find out is that you know there is they are actually gradually getting involved in politics, and because they're getting involved in politics, it's going to be very very difficult to get rid of them because the the politician had them in their pockets before, but they've used extortion, kidnapping, and all kind of criminal activities to amass wealth for themselves. They have weapons now, unlike before, and so they could face any 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 group that comes against them, any, any deployment against them, they could actually face them. But that is where the challenge is now, is how to be able to resolve the issue, because we cannot use security alone or security intervention as the only source to resolve this issue. They need to be a political solution, and that is even inviting these individuals into the political scene and ask them to drop their weapon. That might be the only solution to resolving this issue because the way everything is spread now, the chaos on ground now makes it very, very difficult to be able to get rid of these individuals. Mm -hmm.
and to a, a, a bit of uh, historical uh, background here because in 2019 the united nations rounded off 15 years of uh, peacekeeping operations in, in haiti and the un's uh, departure we understand forced many aid groups uh, to withdraw that we understand has also spiraled the country into social unrest w once again as we are seeing now so I i'm i'm wondering uh do you think the un should consider going back to haiti especially when you also consider the uh, other global events russia's invasion of ukraine for instance israel uh, and the hamas conflicts uh, i wonder if the un even have the capacity uh to look after to or to go back to haiti um i think the un has the capacity to go back but we need to look at what is happening with the neighboring country which is the republic uh, uh, dominica dominica that as actually, even though the UN announced that there's going to be some kind of border, you know, interventions that is coming through there to, you know, the airspace, and they said, no, we're not opening up our airspace, you know. So, so we have a problem where even the countries that are bordering them are not ready, you know, to allow access to their country. So that's one bit. But we know that this scandal does not just stop with the United Nations withdrawing, we know there was a scandal with some of the, you know, um, charity organizations being embroidered in some sex uh, scandal, you know, at one point. And that was part of the challenges that resulted in some of them withdrawing. So there's a lot of challenges on ground. But I think while we are looking for a security intervention to resolve, to, to at least maintain law and order, there is need to try and bring these uh, armed groups, reduce their capacity to create arm or chaos. Because they've got weapons now, similar to what happened in Libya, it's going to be very difficult when you have these groups that are enshrined in there not to get them involved in the political solution. Otherwise, they will just more or less overthrow whoever mm. you know, comes in place to provide political solution. Mm. I mean, just before I, I let you go, let me squeeze in a question or two. So uh, my, my question would be, what's ahead for Haiti? What's ahead for Haiti is that there is there is need for a political solution. But to get that political solution, we need to find a solution to the um, criminal gangs. Now, if they are, if they are you know, what you call a regular army, it is easy to, to go after their leaders and say, these guys know that they can't go anywhere. So they have to enshrine themselves in there and try to get a bit of political leverage. And that's the reason why they, they are interested in politics. So the best way is to say, okay, come and get involved in the political solution. And I don't see how that nine man committee or nine committee member will be able to do that with that the intervention of these guys being involved. So I think there is, is there is a need to try and find a political solution that involves bringing those people on board so that they will not, you know, squatter or destroy this political solution or pathway that the United Nations, US, and other, you know, Caribbean countries are looking to to uh, introduce to help. Uh, create safety and security in Haiti. Absolutely. Well, the country's uh, recent history has been uh, marked by a lot of instability and conflicts. Uh, but we hope that all of this would end pretty soon. Uh, we must thank you most kindly uh, for speaking with us here on the program, Preventive Terrorism Consultant and President Africa Security Forum, Temitokwe Olodo, live for us in Kent, England. Thank you so much for having me. All right, away from Haiti now, the United Nations says it is finalizing and implementing a political roadmap for Yemen. It comes as hopes for a nation ceasefire and efforts to improve the living conditions in Yemen is stalling. We had hoped and the Yemenis had expected that by this Ramadan, we would have had an agreement on a nationwide ceasefire and measures to improve living conditions in Yemen. I had hoped I would be briefing you about the preparations for an inclusive political process. 
public sector employees across the country should have been receiving their salaries and pensions. Oil exports should have resumed, which could have enabled more effective service delivery and improved economic conditions. And we should have had another agreement on the release of prisoners, allowing loved ones to return home in time for Ramadan. While these hopes and expectations have not, to date, been met, our efforts in finalizing and implementing a United Nations roadmap remain undeterred. The longer the escalatory uh, environment continues, the more challenging Yemen's mediation space will become. With more interests at play, the parties to the conflict in Yemen and more likely, are more likely to shift calculations and alter their negotiation agendas. In a worst-case scenario, the parties could decide to engage in risky military adventurism that propels Yemen back into a new cycle of war. For most people in Yemen, food insecurity is an issue of affordability, not accessibility. As people in Yemen very clearly told me when I visited governorates of Aden, Sana'a and Amran last week, they want sustainable solutions to the causes of their humanitarian needs and the opportunity to define for themselves how to rebuild their futures. Well, let's bring you up to speed with stories around the continent. And we begin here in East Africa, where militants uh, from the Al-Shabaab group have attacked a hotel near the presidential palace in Somalia's capital, Mogadishu. Witnesses report that several gunmen forced their way into the building after destroying the perimeter wall with a heavy explosion. More blasts and gunfire were then reported coming from within the hotel. Unconfirmed reports say four uh, Somali MPs were wounded, but the government has not commented on the incident. The Islamist group has attacked the SYL hotel previously, which is popular with government officials. Thanks indeed for staying with us. Let's talk artificial intelligence now, where U.S. and member states have introduced a U.N. General Assembly resolution that aims to articulate a shared approach to AI systems. Artificial U.S. Ambassador to the United AI Nations, Linda Thomas Greenfield, says AI has a great potential to shape the world for the better. The resolution calls on member states to promote safe and trustworthy AI systems to address the world's greatest challenges. Artificial intelligence, or AI, has enormous potential to shape our economies, society, and the world for the better. And that we must ensure these benefits extend across the globe to countries at all levels of development. For that reason, the United States, with broad consensus from member states, has introduced a United Nations General Assembly resolution for consideration that aims to articulate a shared approach to AI systems. The resolution calls on member states to promote safe, secure, and trustworthy AI systems to address the world's greatest challenges, including those related to poverty, poverty elimination, global health, food security, climate, energy and education. We're resolved to bridge the artificial intelligence and other digital divides between and within countries through capacity building, increasing digital literacy and other actions. Consensus on this important topic could help extend the benefits of AI to member states across all regions and development levels in support of the 2030 agenda for sustainable development. In the meantime, a comprehensive framework for regulating artificial intelligence has just been passed by EU Parliament. The landmark legislation is the first of its kind and it sets a global standard for other governing bodies. Well, join us uh, now for more is DW correspondent Emily Leshner in Berlin. Emily, walk us through these latest new rules. 
Hi, thanks for having me. Well, the first thing uh, it does is assign different types or uses of AI into categories according to its perceived risk. So uses that are classified as low risk might include AI that's used to recommend uh, content to you when you're scrolling through a website or Instagram, um, or perhaps filtering spam from your inbox. These don't have too many restrictions around it. But AI that's classified as high risk, so perhaps AI that's used in robots to do medical surgeries or in self-driving cars uh, or systems that might analyze and then try to predict social behavior. These uh, forms of high risk AI uses have much tighter regulations around them. And then what the law does is ban certain types of AI outright. This is AI that might be used to infer someone's race, religion, or sexual orientation, and then use that analysis for predictive policing. Uh, another banned use would be to use real-time facial recognition in public spaces like China has been doing for several years now. And the, the new law, it even mandates that the data that's used to train AI programs has to be checked, uh, and people who provide data have to be told what the information is used for, similar to the data protection laws that Europe enacted in 2018. And then companies that don't comply with these laws, they could face fines from 7 to 35 million euros, not an insignificant amount by any means, even on the lower end of the scale. Uh, and so between the bans and the high fines. This is why you might hear some saying that these EU laws are strict. Mm. And Emily, can, can I ask you, what prompted the EU to create this framework? Well, AI has been around for some time now, but it, it wasn't until recent developments with generative tools like ChatGBT that the world collectively realized the very, very quick rate at which the technology's capabilities are progressing. And some of AI's own engineers began warning of its dangers. A former Google engineer said that AI could become more intelligent than humans, that this was likely, uh, which is not hard to believe when some of the senior managers at, at Google Google there and at Microsoft have said that they don't even know how AI works anymore. And Sam Altman, who is a CEO of, of OpenAI, the company that created ChatGBT, uh, he testified in front of U.S. Congress last year saying that there was a strong need to regulate AI. And to, to use his words, he says he said that if uh, something went wrong, it would go very wrong. So when you combine the rate at which AI is developing with some of its own creators and engineers warning about about how powerful it can be and, and will continue to become, putting in place uh, putting in place a framework like this one, like the one the EU has done, just makes sense. And even some EU officials have said that by the time the law goes into effect, that AI might have already outpaced the law in certain ways in terms of what it can do. Mm. One final question. How are these regulations going to impact the AI industry as, as a whole? Well, Europe is really setting an example here and a, and a standard with these new rules. Several other governing bodies have expressed the need for regulating AI in the past uh, one to two years, and they're going to refer to these new ones set by the EU as they draft their own legislation. U.S. Congress is working on rules for AI at the moment, and they have been in contact with EU officials. And now that these have been passed by the EU, by European Parliament, it's, it's going to really light a fire under other governments to speed things up and start to do the same. All right. DW correspondent Emily Lesnar, right for, live for us in Berlin. All right, two other stories now. In a bit to bluster citizen engagement and accountability in governance, Yaga Africa's Turn Up Democracy initiative launches the Digital Democracy Fair. The primary objective of the fair is to showcase tech innovations and digital tools specifically designed for civic engagement creating an environment where tech innovators and civic actors can collaborate to drive social change. Every single one of us will... It's a mix of tech enthusiasts and civic-minded individuals at the Lagos Digital Democracy Fair, where the aim is to spotlight tech innovations that empower citizens to engage with the government, demand accountability, and take meaningful civic action. The fair, a collaborative effort between Yaga Africa's Turn Up Democracy Initiative and Civic Hive, isn't just about showcasing fancy gadgets. It's 
it's about leveraging technology to strengthen democracy and ensure accountability. And it's designed to provide a platform to showcase civic tech innovations that either promote civic education and promote demand for accountability um, and then promote civic engagement. So what, you are, what we have today is we have over 12 innovators, people who have tech solutions. Um, for instance, there's one around how to dispel disinformation, things around how to protect human rights or report human rights abuse, things like how to hold the government to account based on their promises during the elections. And the idea of the fair is in the pre-elections phase, we hosted a civic tech camp that looked at young people who use digital tools to promote civic youth participation in the election. So after elections, what next? And so this time around, the tools that people are showcasing is basically what they've designed that can promote citizens' engagement with the government at the federal level, at the state level, and at the local government level. And we have over 12 innovators, and most of them from the southwestern part. Like you see, this is happening in Lagos. The idea is subsequently we can scale it at the national level. From apps facilitating citizen government communication to platforms promoting civic engagement, the Digital Democracy Fair is a hub for tech innovators and civic actors to collaborate for social change. The app is, is actually developed for people to have access to report cases of abuse, especially related, those related to abuse of human rights. This come extension will help you spotlight a speech issues and we intend to work with uh, platform owners to ensure that these speech are not amplified. The, the Truly Verify Africa, a mobile responsive site that is supposed to empower Nigerians from 18 years and above to stop the spread of misinformation and fake news. Um, leading up to not just only 2023 elections, but also post-general elections. It is also an avenue to identify new opportunities for improving citizens' engagement with public officials and improve understanding of the impact of digital transformation on democracy and public participation. The most critical thing is that we see a lot of activity um, in the digital space. You see a lot of activity, you see a lot of activity on social media. How do you turn that into practical action? Um, how do you get young people to, to really engage um, and to transfer that work from, from the digital platforms um, into, into the, the democratic arena to really engage with different levels of accountability, um, different levels of governance? of the governance process. The Lagos Digital Democracy Fair encourages civil society organizations, civic actors and tech innovators to leverage digital tools to address issues such as civic participation, governance and public accountability. And finally on the program, how high can you fly to have fun. I'm talking as high as 200 meters. Well, let's hope you don't have a phobia of heights because people are flocking to an aerial playground in China despite growing calls for safety concerns. The playground, which features a large net suspended at a height of 200 meters, which is about uh, 650 feet between two cliffs, has become a popular tourist spot. It is located within the Goose Team Adventure Park in Zhuyang Village in China. Adults and young children can be seen playing with a ball or jumping and relaxing on the net, painted in green and white, synonymous to the colors of a football field. The playground is reportedly made of high density uh, polyethnically and divided into two levels. The upper one is for visitors to enjoy, while the lower floor serves as a safety barrier. Now, some safety concerns have been raised, but according to the owners, the facility can only accommodate 50 people at a time, and the visitor's weight is limited to a maximum of 90 kilograms. Well, I may just have to add a visit to the aerial playground in eastern China to my bucket list. And we're talking a height of 200 meters, which is approximately 650 feet. Would you give that a try? That does it for us here on the program. Everyone, thanks indeed for watching. I am Kelly Egiga. Bye now.